Hey everybody, welcome to LinuxCast. I'm your host, Matt. I'm Tyler. And I'm Steve. And I'm Josh. Welcome to the LinuxCast, guys. So, we have been streaming for many hours today. So if you haven't caught it already, the four of us, along with several others, including DT, the Linux Tube, Jesse, Nate, whole bunch of guys, got together, did the Linux Tube Christmas special. It's on my channel, it's on DT's, it's on Josh's, it's on the Linux Tube, obviously. Whole bunch of us streamed it. All you can go back and watch it. We had loads of fun. So you definitely should go check that out. Check the the rebroadcast of that. We're not gonna pull it down or anything. So it's 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 great. So, yeah, so we've been streaming for a while, and uh, now we have a podcast to do. So, this is the Linux cast. We talk about Linuxy things. And yes, I know two things before. If you're watching the video, no fancy smancy graphics. We're having some technical difficulties all damn day today, so this is just easier. Uh, second, yes, there's going to be annoying effing green flashes on my webcam. It's a stupid Brio problem. It can't be fixed without a workaround. I don't want to redo the workaround, so I'm burning the the camera in effigy the next time i get uh, get a new camera so that's in the plan it's so it's so bad i'm so pissed off at it but anyways just let you know you don't have to sit in the chat you don't have to talk about the green flashes i know that they're there they're annoying me just as way more than they're annoying you so yeah <laughs> trust me every time i see one you're gonna see me just crunch my fucking i'm gonna become joe pesci in home alone Anyways, uh, welcome to Linux Cast. We talk about Linuxy things, but before we, and we have a topic for the day. But before we jump into that, we're gonna go go around the horn and talk about the things that we've been doing in open source this week. So Tyler, you first. Damn green flashes. <laughs> so I have been diving into NixOS a ton, and it's been a lot of fun. I did not expect to enjoy NixOS nearly as much as I have. The User experience is not for everyone. It's definitely not a distro that's for everyone, but I found it to be quite enjoyable and it does serve a good purpose. And it is, it, it, there, there is a lot of very fun things that you can do. Like, right, I, I wasn't able to stream the Christmas special because last night, I decided that it would be a good idea to mess around with a whole bunch of my system and on top of that run Nix OS for the first time from a temp uh, temp FS because Nix OS only requires slash boot and slash Nix to actually get a bootable usable system. So you're able to run the pretty much the entire root directory inside your RAM, which is cool. And that's what I was doing, but you know, it caused some issues along the way because I, it, it was my first time doing it and, you know, I met, I made some mistakes, but that's just a, an example of some of the cool stuff you can do with it. So I've been having a lot of fun. I have Nix installed on this computer and on the one behind me doing a long-term review of it. And my thoughts are this, a lot of times they do things differently just to be different. It's the way it feels a lot of the times. Like, why did you choose to do it this way? Yeah, it doesn't really feel like you have a technical reason to do that. But that's you, that's just my thought. So, anyways, yeah, next is West is whatever. So, Steve, what have you been up to this week? I haven't been up to too much because my brother just came in from from Dubai and for two for a couple of days. So I've been being with him, but. When it comes to Linux and open source, I've been trying to discover more and more apps as much as I can. And uh, I've been working again with Docker containers for the third week in a row. <laughs> hey, you like them, but, you like them. Uh, well, yeah, it's, they're, they're something else. They're, they're just another animal. And I discovered more more containers and i've been messing with those and finally i've been working on calamaris because calamaris finally got a stable 3.3 release after what two years uh, of alphas i've been work um, i've been working on that because it now ha supports qt6 i've been trying to mess with pipewire but i'll talk more in that uh, about that because that's my nightmare story of the week we're definitely not doing nightmares every week that'd be just bad <laughs> but you're right. <laughs> right matt can you do your segment somebody's knocking on my door sure all right so 
let me talk a little bit about what I've been doing. So I've been doing, I, I, I've been talking about this a little bit for the last two and a half weeks or so. I've been doing the GNOME challenge. I've, I've promised to use GNOME for six months just to see if I can. And everything was going fine until this morning, to be honest with you. I had been, I used Wayland for the last seven days because I got a new monitor. I got a, a LG dual-up monitor, which is really cool, but it's 1440p, and I needed scaling. And scaling doesn't work well in Xorg at all, especially when you mix and match resolutions. So I bit the bullet, used the Wayland session, and used it for seven days. It's buggy and a whole bunch of stuff just wasn't working. Gaming on Wayland is just fucking utter garbage i mean it's like horseshit is what it is it's really really bad especially especially maybe it's not for every game but for the games that i play specifically in C so C city skylines is not the best optimized game for linux period but it works good enough on xorg on wayland oh my god is it bad like horrendous uh, i i played a little bit of madden could hardly get that to launch in Wayland. Works fine in Xorg. Same things with Sims. I also played uh, several other games, tr tried to play several other games in Wayland. Just couldn't get them to either launch. Some of them did launch and played, but w was either laggy or, you know, had some stutters. It was it was really bad. Either I'm doing something wrong. Yeah, I was, go I was going to ask you about the stuttering and the flicker, the flickering. Yeah, it just, it doesn't, it's not, it's not very a very good experience. So, uh, yesterday or the day before, I went back to Xorg on GNOME, and I was having a good time. It, it, it works fine. But then this morning when I was setting up for the Christmas special, got Discord up and running, had things going, the camera stopped working. And then I finally got the camera to start working, and, it, and the audio was going bad. And, and so nobody could hear any of the desktop audio. And from what I could tell... You know, you guys know how GNOME has those security settings that control whether or not the, the they tell you basically tell you whether or not it, the your 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 camera's on and your microphone's recording. For whatever reason, it, sh it saw the microphone just fine, but the webcam wasn't appearing at all. Like you, there was no icon, nothing like that. So it was something going on with there. I, I'm gonna have to do some experimenting. So, long story short. I had to quickly get out of GNOME this morning, break my challenge just a little bit, and head on over to Hyperland, which, guys, I like Hyperland. It has a lot of really cool features. Outside of the whole monitors not going off thing, I'd probably use Hyperland, but I don't want to be in Hyperland right now because it's giving me a taste of a window manager again, and I have to go back to GNOME if I'm going to finish my challenge. I really don't want to. I, I like It's... When Just so you know, in Hyperland, I figured out how to make your screens automatically turn time out and go off. How? Yeah, tell me this. Tell me this magic. So you can use Sway Idle uh, to initiate it. Sorry, buddy. But you don't have to. Is there another way? You can, yeah, you could just write a script for a timeout function that runs HyperCTL dispatch DPMS off, and then your screens will turn off. Now, you also need to go into your Hyperland config inside of your, if you don't already have it, make it a MISC session for like miscellaneous and add mouse move underscore like or like it, it's like it's like mouse move enables dps you said that's just true and keyboard press enables uh dpms true yeah i'm gonna tell you i i will try that but i guarantee it's not gonna work because i already use dpms and this way idle stuff i've also created a script for it didn't work see the thing is it's not that the mouse that won't work won't wake it up it's just that it wakes up on its own it will it will go to sleep and immediately kick right back in now the thing is i'm 100 percent. it's not a high by the way this is not hyperland's problem it happens on gnome too i can only reason gnome has worked for me is because i've gotten hi, hibernation to work hibernation you'll just turn the computer off you go to sleep that works fine I, i've t learned to live with that still can't get the monitors to go to sleep just to s go to sleep that's on gnome hyperland and it doesn't matter if it's x org or wayland they both do it i'm almost and see, I thought that it was the external hard drive because external hard drives do that from time to time. So I unhooked that. What I ended up doing was I ended up unhooking every single USB thing that was connected to my computer except for the mouse and keyboard. It still did it. So it wasn't the the thing. And that leaves, because it's almost it's almost 100% positive a hardware problem because it, it, it spans distributions, spans window managers, spans display servers and compositors, all of it. So 
there is something going on in that motherboard settings that's stopping this from working. Almost 100% positive that it's something in the motherboard. And Are the thing you using is, HDMI or DisplayPort? I'm using both. Using both, so it's so is it a DisplayPort to HDMI? No, or I. Are you talking about like there's a DisplayPort cable to DisplayPort? No, he's talking about he's and then like HDMI to he's HDMI. Got dedicated display, DisplayPort, dedicated HDMI. Yeah, so both. So the the LG Dual Up has two. One's an HDMI, one's an, a DisplayPort. Both of those are plugged in directly to an HDMI and a DisplayPort. The 32 inch in front of me has a display port that one's also connected into a display port. Now, previously, when I was still having the problem and I had just the 27 inch monitor, that was a VGA which was connected to a dongle that went into an HDMI. But that's gone. And that so that I, if that was the problem, I'd have fixed it because I no longer use it, but it still happens. It's the same, same issue. Like I said, somebody mentioned something in one of the because con- I obviously have mentioned this all over the damn place because I can't. It's just so fucking infuriating. That I can't. This is like the one problem on Linux that I just can't solve. And so I mentioned all over the place. Somebody in one of the comments in, on one of my videos has, has told me that there's some setting. I don't remember what it was. In a lot of BIOS, uh, you know, mechanisms that it caused this issue. And the thing is, is that I am scared shitless of BIOS. <laughs> like I have a phobia about it because back in the like the day, back in the Windows 98 era. You get into the BIOS and you can really fuck some shit up, <laughs> and that just scares the crap out of me. And I got like I have to have this computer; it's got to work. Like, like I can, like I have laptops and stuff, and like, and I could use those for a little while, but it would drive me bonkers with a small screen. I have to have the screen real estate; it drive me nuts. So, anyways, the long you're story. Kind of, you kind of you. You kind of like me. You you kind of like me. I had the phobia of BIOS for like at least six or seven years before I entered the BIOS and played around with it and at the time the first time i messed with bios i entered the password a random password and i couldn't figure it out and the only way to reset it is take it back to the factory i mean i'm a little bit better now because i've been in there and i've because when i first built this computer the fan curves were all over the f- i mean they were really bad i mean they were they, they were running full blast when it was cool and they were not running at all when it was hot. It was really stupid. So I had to get in there and fix all that stuff. And I have no clue what's going on there. But to be honest with you, I don't like the Gigabyte key- um, motherboard that I have. It was a pain in the ass to build with. I'd never do it again. Uh, but I don't... See, the thing is, my my solution is either to figure out the BIOS thing, if I can figure out that. So that's the first step. If I can't... If, if that's not the issue, then I'm at a loss. So it's either you know, replace the motherboard and figure out what the hell is going on. Because this is an important thing for me. I like My computer stays on, I've talked about this before, as a file server. It, it backs up all the computers around the house, you know, overnight, and it just stays on. But I don't want the monitors on because I sleep in this room. <laughs> so I can either turn them off, you know, manually, which is a pain in the ass, because it takes, you know, or I can figure out this problem, and it's just, it's a, it's a pain in the ass, because it's just a pain. So, uh, Josh, uh, what have you been up to this week in open source? I have been attempting to to uh, stick around on a di- on a distro, and because you know I need some stability in my life for a little bit, and because these next these next few months I'm going to be extremely busy, and I won't have time to be like tinkering with the distros, because you know I'm I'm actually going I'm actually trying to commit to like trying to record videos and be able to post them as well as you know keep up with the distro hacking, and you know. I need like a stable basis for for a little bit, so my my very first solution is I've I've actually distro hopped like seventeen times in the in the last couple of weeks, uh, because you know I'm trying to get something that's not going to break on me, right right right. So my first experience was with Nix OS, and it's like yeah we're 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 gonna try this with Nix because you know uh, if you break Nix you can just roll back and you know all the things that they advertise. So. Uh, w- I'm sitting there with Nix, and then I remember, remember oh yeah, I gotta be productive, because you know, I, I have a stakeholder in the job title, so I gotta pull up the software for work that I gotta use, too. I, I'm not gonna list the, the name for it or anything like that, but it, it's binary compatible with Linux, but it, it fully, but it's hard-coded to expect a Linux file system hierarchy sta- standard thing, and I couldn't figure out Nix Alien to, for the life of me. So, uh, this, this software just would not work. Because it has to be installed into slash opt and then expect and then expects path out of slash bin. <laughs> so we 
so couldn't get that to work, so I left NixOS. And then after that, I was just like, okay, so what's another distro that, like, advertises that you can just roll back on? OpenSUSE, right? OpenSUSE makes perfect sense with, the, like, the ButterFS inter- integrations and everything. And even then, like, this software is, pa- is prepackaged as an RPM, too. So I, so that kind of the best of all the world, right? So I install OpenSUSE. And I run the pseudo zipper DUP because, you know, we installed the tumbleweed because, you know, we need that newer kernel because Intel Arc. And immediately, bricks itself. And I hit a uh, corruption. I hit a, I think uh, this was when they were dealing with, like, their, their mirror issues. Because uh, I was able to pull in the updates. But apparently, the ButterFS progs package was corrupted or something like that. Because it completely zeroed my entire disk. <laughs> and I'm like, well, that open uh, di- that installed didn't last very long. Yeah, that, that so then it's two like, days okay. was really bad with the mirrors and stuff because there's a lot of corrupted packages and stuff. Yeah, it was bad. Yeah, so so after that, it's like, okay, well, if open source is going to immediately brick itself, and uh, I can see that uh, there's people talking about issues with open source, so let's let's try a different distro. So I install Ubuntu 23.10, and it's like, okay, so Ubuntu is up, it's working perfectly fine. Oh wait. It's running ext4. Oh crap! I just I just hit that corruption bug on ext4. We're completely blew itself up again. <laughs> of course, I didn't find this out until the next day. So it's like, why did I wound up like reinstalling? I I installed I started with Kubuntu, that bricked itself. That so then I installed Zubuntu for like the XFCE. It's like XFCE totally isn't going to kill itself or anything like that. Immediately broke, immediately bricked itself, and then just like, okay, Ubuntu proper. I don't like Ubuntu's GNOME session, but if if it's what's going to work, we're going to go with it. So I install that, bricks itself again, all because of that, all because of that ext4 corruption bug. <laughs> so like, oh, okay, so the ext4. The XT4 corruption bug, I just downloaded a video that I'm going to watch later about that. Well, then, Steve, just for you, I installed Zero Linux, right? And it, as you guys might know, I have famous history with stability on Arch Linux, where I Pac-Man, and Pac-Man just gives me a 404 on a mirror that I can ping. <laughs> like, what in the world is going on? Pac-Man, why? You, this was your chance. This was your chance for me to stay on the Arch Linux or like an Arch-based system for longer than a week. And immediately, what it is, what it, what the what the issue is, is that Pac-Man can see that I have an internet connection, but it can't index DNS. But I can open up a Firefox web browser and I can ping through DNS. So I don't know why Pac-Man doesn't work. Do you use a different DNS servers? Somewhere along the line, okay. You replace I, your DNS. I, I changed DNS servers. I I pu- I pulled in a whole new mirrorless and everything. The only way I can get Pac-Man to work is if I boot a live image. Ch and uh, not even ch root w- would work. What I would have to do is I would have to use a Pac-Man command from the Arch install media, and then tell Pac-Man to install things to a remote root directory. <laughs> Yeah, well, I was going to say, one of these days, Josh is just going to pull down the entire AUR, store it on a server someplace, and point Pac-Man at the server in his closet. <laughs> I, I honestly think that's what I'm going to have to wind up doing one of these days. <laughs> <laughs> but, so, you know, like, okay. What's, uh, there's, there's only one distro left that I'm willing to try this week. And that is Debian, but I don't want to be running Debian testing because Debian testing doesn't do security updates. So it's like, do I want to live like the Sid lifestyle? I'm like, no. I'm curious, so I so I checked like Debian backports page because I know that sometimes they backport newer kernels into into the stable branch, and I'm like, oh, kernel six point five is in backports because I was this close, this close to pulling the Arc GPU out of my system, but thankfully Debian's got the six point five kernel in in there. So I'm still rocking an Arc GPU, <laughs> and uh, I'm on Debian now. Uh, even though you know I've had to completely recompile Firefox because somebody packaged it wrong. Why did you just use a flat pack? Because I didn't think about it. <laughs> oh, makes sense. No, I actually really don't like the flat pack version of Firefox because I do use I do make I do make a, a use of a couple extensions that uh, interact with like external programs, and the flat pack just doesn't communicate properly. My biggest pro- issue with Flatpak is if or with the Flatpak version of Firefox is the same issue I have with all Flatpaks is that the theming is just always fucking wrong. 
we've got Darth Vader sitting here sent, telling me to go back to Gen 2. Well, I did I did attempt Gen 2 as well. XDG Desktop Portal is still inherently broken, and Intel Arc is still a very bad experience on Xorg. All right, so that actually worked out really well for your horror story, John. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this week's main topic. So originally, I know last week I promised you guys a game of some sort, but between real life nonsense and just not being able to get around, the, the game thing didn't happen. The, the the little bit of prep work I did on it, just it didn't feel right. So what we've decided to do instead is we're going to talk today about some of the times that Linux has made us her bitch. So we're going to talk about some horror stories, things where, you know, you got into a, a pickle where Linux just did really not treat you right, where, you know, you had some really problems and you couldn't solve it and either caused you to distro hop or reinstall or whatever. So that's what we're going to do. And I have a couple of these. I know Josh has quite a few. So we're going to, we're just going to go around, just do one at a time. If we have time, we'll go back around again. So Tyler, tell us a time when you've had some problems with Linux that you just made you want to pull your hair out. Probably. The worst, the worst one is when Deadside first made the switch over to Easy Anti Cheat, because that one got me really upset. Because I thought my entire install had just like got corrupted or something. Because you know it started kicking me out all of a sudden from playing the game, and I was like, "What in the heck, man? Come on, what's happening?" And then after I did a reinstall and then loaded in the game and it still did it, I did a Google search and, oh yeah, they've enabled easy anti-cheat. So you're going to have to have a Windows install to be able to play it. That one I was pretty upset. Now, that one's not Linux's fault or anything, but at the same time, like, at first I thought it was. I was like, oh God, what's happened? It's just so Tyler to be have his horror story have to do with death with death's side. Well, I mean, I had to go over and use Windows to be able to play a game. That is like, horrifying. <laughs> exactly. Come on now. Work on Windows or Linux. It's like 2023. Come on. <laughs> All right. Steve, your horror story. My horror story, like I alluded to earlier, is related to Pipewire. I know I don't want to drag a story too long, but everybody knows the horror stories with Pipewire as of late. I'm not saying in general, I'm just saying as of late, because I'm still pulling my hair out, whatever I got left of my hair. Uh, <laughs> I got enough of it to pull right now. Tomorrow is another day. But the reason for which I'm pulling my hair out was I was recording a, uh, a meeting with, with someone related to potential work. And it was a three-hour call. And the audio was showing everywhere. Okay, I enabled echo cancellation, and I used our boy Tyler's config because he says, he kept, he kept saying, it's working. The magic, oh, and I, I couldn't hear Buddy here barking when he kept saying, this, this dog is going crazy. And I was like, what is he talking about? I can't hear a thing. I'm like, that echo canceling, cancellation module is working magic. So why not enable it on my end? So I did enable it and everything, and all the audio graph was working and everything. I was like, yay, I'm recording the whole session with, uh, with a potential boss. And, and then when I uh, listened back to the video, there was no audio. Absolutely no audio. So, and I, I thought... I, I, something happened in Pipewire like it usually happens where it turns your microphone into the output for whatever reason so I checked that I tried to play back a YouTube video on in the browser I wasn't getting any audio out of the video in the browser I was like what the heck is going on I go to Pavu control it has all the correct things and I saw the, the graphs working and there was audio and then I realized that the audio was coming from the speaker output, which wasn't selected. It, was com uh, it wasn't coming out of the echo cancel sync, which should have been coming out from, because that's the source I said to come out from. And then in the recording, I saw that echo source was selected, but no 
bars were work uh, were moving, the bars that were moving were the ones under the microphone M zero one, whatever it's called, the USB microphone. So I was like, what the heck is going on? As soon as I switch back to uh, switch back to the regular output, I heard audio and I was able to record in Audacity or Ocean Audio, the thing I use. So everything was okay again. As soon as I select echo cancel, everything disappeared. I'm still pulling my hair out, out of this one because I needed the recording because I needed to listen back to all the requirements that, uh, that, that, that or all I was required to do for the job. So I was getting no audio. So, and I've had this issue for the past year and a half. That's why I, I removed that that part from my tool because it wasn't working for me so i was like eh, if people really want it they can follow the the easy guide that i linked to in my forum because if i gave them my configuration and which might break their system i i might be blamed for it so i didn't want anybody to blame me for their uh, issues so i removed it from my script uh, from my script so I'm still, it's a nightmare because I now have an interview that I need without the audio. That's scary. Yeah. Imagine doing that in something more important. Audio's got to work and audio never works. <laughs> it just never works. <laughs> There's me. always some problem with it. Say that again. <laughs> All right, Josh. I don't know why it works for some people. It doesn't work for other people. It, it doesn't. Okay. No rhyme or reason. Okay. Josh, your first one. So let's turn off the lights here, guys. Let's turn off the lights. <laughs> let's do this. <laughs> okay. So the year was 2010. Well, it was actually 2012. It was March of 2012. I'm sitting here on my Ubuntu machine, and I'm looking up the, the documentation on how to upgrade to the next LTS release. Because, you know, this was back when, you know, I was wee little lad, just... Didn't even know what Linux was. I just knew that I had Ubuntu. I didn't know it was Linux. Because, you know, Linux was never mentioned on an Ubuntu box. It was always just Ubuntu. And uh, I'm sitting here on my wonderful, beautifully crafted brown GNOME 2 desktop. And I'm sitting and I'm and I'm making excellent use of Gedit, the world's greatest text editor. Because, you know, Ubuntu didn't ship with Vim still. Actually, I still don't think they ship with them. They don't. And, and I'm e editing and modifying the app sources that list, and I'm changing from fr to the next release branch. I run my pseudo app. I run my pseudo aptitude update, and then I run my pseudo aptitude full dash upgrade, because I'm going to move from Ubuntu 10.04 to Ubuntu 12.04. Now. Those of you that don't know this, this was the end of uh, GNOME 2 with the transition to Unity. I didn't have a backup, and uh, they and they they specifically say don't migrate, fresh install. Bro, bro, so shaggy. I had I had to manually craft my 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 whole system and manually migrate from a GNOME and GTK 2 stack to Unity, which was written with, with this thing called Qt that I'd never heard of before, uh, making use of this library called Vala, and uh, figuring out how to how to migrate to that and be able to hopefully reboot and have a graphical session when my computer booted. It took me about two and a half weeks to figure this out. In the meantime, I'm sitting here, and at the end of the month, I had... Uh, my pre, I had pre finals for my uh, degree coming up, because <laughs> I had to uh, do pre finals. I had to turn in a thesis, then I had finals. <laughs> moral of the story: always have a backup. I think that's gonna be the moral of all of our stories, probably. Well, I I didn't I I, I didn't learn backups until later. That's another story. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, so my first one. So this is this this is by the way is just stupid. So I was on Fedora. I think it was either earlier this year or last year. I think last year when I was b being Fedora fanboy. Fedora had been working out really really well. Been going along for, you know, just a couple months and was 
proclaiming to, to all that would hear me that Fedora was the best Linux distro that you could possibly use. It was the most stable distribution ever. Uh, I, was, I had no problems whatsoever. Pipewire was working for the first time. Just, just you know, chef's kiss. It was awesome, right? And then I went to log into my computer one day, and it kept telling me that the password was wrong. And now you guys are going to remember, I don't use a complicated password on my computer at all. I, I, I for, for online services, yeah, I have a password manager for that. For, to get in my computer, I don't need a, a complicated password. So it's just a couple digits. So I knew I was typing it right. Like, I figured, like, for sure, the first time, maybe I mistyped something. I had my key, my fingers on the wrong, you know, keys or something. Second time, um, typed it in and it said, sorry, password failed. I was like, what the hell's going on here? And, you know, I checked, make sure I didn't have caps lock on. But the problem is my keyboard at the time did not have an indicator and in whether or not the ca caps lock was on. And uh, I don't remember which display manager. Because, like, some display managers will tell you if the caps lock is on. Some of them don't. I don't remember which one I was on, but this one didn't. Uh, apparently, the caps lock was on, which is what caused that first issue. The first time I typed in, the reason why the machine didn't take the password was because the caps lock was on. The thing is, is that when you try a password over and over again and you get continually get it wrong, Pam kicks your ass. Okay, so so Pam has a ten uh, a ten minute timeout. If I guess ten minutes, maybe it's half an hour. It's, it's is it ten minutes, Josh? All right, so ten minutes by default. So for those of you guys who don't know, Pam is what sits behind the display manager and, and sudo and everything that checks your password against the, the password files, right? So if you don't type your password in correctly so many times, it locks you out of your computer. But you gotta remember those first few times, I was typing in with the with the key caps lock on, so I was typing my password wrong, but I didn't realize it. So, but by the time I did, you know, I, I kept just kept typing in, because it's literally three letters. That's all it is. It's it's a D, it's a DT style DT style password. Very safe and secure. You know, and, you know, so the first few times it was working properly, but I was typing in wrong because of the, the caps lock. But I, you know, I, I turned the computer off and turned it back on because I tried like 10 times. And it doesn't, with Pam, it doesn't matter if you turn off and turn, come back on. That timeout still, still there. I'm a very impa impatient person. So after about 10, maybe seven or eight minutes of not getting being able to get into that computer with my password i was like screw this i have ventoy on a, 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 a on a usb key i'm reinstalling fedora uh well actually before i did that i tried to go in and do i what i, I was gonna be good actually I wasn't going to just hop. I actually booted into a live environment and see, tried to ch root into that machine. The problem is, is that if you don't know what the hell you're doing, SC Linux doesn't like that at all. <laughs> so I wasn't able to either even ch root because with ch root, I was actually getting the exact same problem in the live environment where it kept telling me that the password wasn't right. So, and eventually I did get around the SE Linux, but I, for some reason I was still with, I had either activated the PAM lock again, which is probably the case because at that point it had probably been longer than 10 minutes. So I probably had activated it again. And then, so I couldn't get in through the live environment and I ended up having to reboot. The big, the problem ended up being, first off, I didn't know that PAM lock had, a, had the lock mechanism on it. So I had no clue that it had a timeout, had no clue about that. It didn't at that time. It didn't know it existed. But the thing is, that computer, that keyboard at the time, the caps lock was stuck on. So even and you gotta remember, no indicator that whatsoever. There was no light. It was it was just an RGB keyboard, and it was, so there was no indication that that was on. And even you know, normally after a reboot, come back on, the caps lock would go back to the to the off state. This time it didn't. It stayed on, and I had no clue. So I in, I installed Arch. Because I was like, screw this, fuck Fedora, it's no longer my favorite distro, friendship over, right? And so I installed Arch, and because the fucking caps lock was on, when I set up my account, I set it up with cap a cap lock password. And when I went to log in, for whatever reason, caps, uh, caps lock turned itself off, and I could not get the damn password, because I had no clue. Remember, the caps lock was off again now, and I went to sign into Arch, 
and it would not sign me in because the password was wrong. I was like, oh my God, I, I, I was this close, guys. I swear to God to switching to Linux or switching to Windows. And it's like, oh my God, this is so bad. Like, this is the end of my YouTube channel. I'm not going to be able to make videos anymore. I'm going to have to switch to WSL if I want to use Linux. It's going to be horrible. Oh, I, I was so mad. And that was like, it, it, that was like a four hour period where I kept trying to figure out what was going on. And it was that caps lock button switching it, mostly being stuck on. And then every once, it was like it was shorted or something. Like like the key, the 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 switch or whatever, had a like a, a short in it or something. And it was mostly on. It was always depressing itself. Really weird. And what I ended up having to do was actually replace the. I, I the, it didn't have a hot swap hot swap keyboards at that time, so it was just replaced the keyboard. I was I was so frustrated. The, the good news is I learned about the timeout of, of Pam now. And I know about that. So I, I, just PSA, you type your password in multiple times wrong, and then it locks you out. It's not going to tell you that it, you're locked out. It doesn't do that. Well, at least the, the display manager, the display manager doesn't. Yeah, the display manager doesn't. If you're trying from the shell, it will tell you. Yeah. Well, yeah. This was the display manager. I couldn't get to the fucking shell. Well, I, I could. I I could have tried. I don't really remember because I'm sure somewhere along the line I was like, well, you know what? Obviously, this is a display manager problem because, like I talked about last week, display managers are always fucking breaking. So I I'm sure that somewhere along the line I went into a TTY and tried to do it. I don't remember why it. It seems like it would have told me that you're locked out, but it didn't maybe, maybe it only tells you that first time i don't know it will tell you if you're on a new session so if you're switching to a tty it would tell you that this account is locked you have you have this number of minutes left it, it that's what it is supposed to tell you but that can that can actually be disabled in in the pam configuration as well maybe fedora has that disabled or something because I, I don't remember that saying because i learned about the pam lockout like the day afterwards when I, cause I think that was, I think that was like the day I decided I was going to switch to like, I was either going to try gen two or red core or something. I, I wanted something completely different. Cause obviously uh, the ones I was more familiar with, you know, I, I just needed something stable and I was looking for something. And I learned that like the day afterwards that, that Pam lock was there and I was like, oh, God, because by that time I had been able to get into a system and figured out that the caps lock key was all fucked up. And I learned why it kept locking me out. Like, that's that's my number one because <laughs> I was so frustrated. That's, that's the closest I've been in the last six years of, of saying, fuck Linux. I'm done with this nonsense. Obviously, they can't even do this right. I'm leaving. <laughs> it was that's the closest I've ever been. It was close. And I, I mean, I'm glad I figured it out, but goodness gracious, that was that was really bad. All right, Tyler, do you have another horror story for us? Yeah, yeah. So since we're all around the campfire, look, there was this one time. Should have had fucking s'mores. Where, I'm just saying. <laughs> yes, you're gonna need it. You need to calm down the the anxiety that this will cause you. So there was uh, once upon a time, a man was installing Linux. And he decided that he was going to do something a little bit new. He was going to try Chintu for the first time. And the thing about Gentoo that you really do need to know is the handbook does cover everything and you cannot skip around with it. There's no such thing as skimming the handbook and then installing the Gentoo successfully the first time. It doesn't really happen. So I decided I was going to go ahead, skim through it, install it. And I did. The only problem is, is I couldn't figure out why it wouldn't boot. And by the grace of God, I was able to figure it out. And I don't even know what it was that was the problem. But eventually I got booted into a working Gen 2 install. Once that happened, I did... I did something a little dumb that you shouldn't do. I set all of my use flags inside of my make.conf. Now, Josh and any other Gen 2 user can explain to you why that is a horrible idea. 
just in general, it's not a good idea. So I had a whole bunch of, of issues around like, I wouldn't say rendering, but like applications, not just looking right or coming up like they were slow to load and stuff. And one of the things I did not know about Gentoo at the time was yeah, you can't, you can't do that. You can't do that and expect to be able to easily find out your problem. Ma- mainly because some, some flags you don't want to set for every program. And when it does cause like, you know, a, Oh good Lord. What's the thing where it's an endless loop of conflicting packages. Oh, a circular dependency. Yes. Yeah. Circular dependencies. So like, I mean, if you have stuff that like causes that you'll end up continually running into it because of what you're doing on like globally in the make.conf. So yeah, that time I I went from Gen to, and I think that's when I finally installed Debian and decided to stick with Debian. I think I spent like probably a month or two on Debian after that. The first time I got Gen two actually installed, it scared me away from it so bad. I used Debian for like a while just to go the complete opposite route. <laughs> now, granted, I've come back since then. It's it's much better than that, but yeah, don't do that. It's a bad time, and it will very much upset you. Don't advise it <laughs> one bit. All right, Steve, you have another story for us. I guess Josh was right. If you think back uh, far enough, you'll find an, a, a horror story. I thought I had only one, but let's go way back to 1994. My first foray in a non-Windows. I'm just saying Tyler can't go back that far. I literally can't. <laughs> That's before I was born. <laughs> well, for the elderly here who can go way back to 1994 to my first foray to a non-Mac or uh, Windows machine into something called Unix. And we had a silicon graphics computer that cost my dad Mm $24,000 because it was fully scuzzied up. I sit on that thing and I discover something. $24,000? Yeah. Sick. (laughs) (laughs) Well, it was because of a previous gig that where he won awards and things. But okay. I discovered for the first time something called command line. And it was a wonderful world that made me feel like a god. Only to dis while well, typing pseudo commands, pseudo style commands. I forgot what it was called back then. <laughs> My memory is not that great. So basically to enter directories and it had this shelf looking thing on the left side, on the top left. Uh, I think Enlightenment has that style still. I don't remember. But I was messing around with it, and I decided, what the hell? Let me run this command that it keeps telling me not to run. You know, like what happened with Linus Tech Tips on his Linux challenge? It kept telling me, don't run this command. It's not safe to run this command. But I was like, hey, you challenging me? <laughs> I am the Lord so Almighty. I was like, <laughs> yeah, I am, the, I am your creator. So I am one of your creators. So you let me through, please. So I did run this command. And what this resulted in was a wonderful wall of matrix code style, <laughs> just lines of code coming, coming through and then. It's it was the equivalent of sudo rmrf uh, root directory. Uh, oh, nice! Whatever. So what you're saying is, is you tried to list a directory and then deleted everything. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> and the problem, the problem there was, we did not at the time the the software that was on there that my dad used for his production was. Uh, did not provide the disk. So it was provided as installed already on the computer. It was called Gig3D. 
So we didn't have the disk to reinstall. We had the system disk. No problem. We could reinstall the system disk. It was it came on a, this round thing that used to be called a CD. Yeah. So and our CD drive was one of those caddy drives. You put the CD in a box that looked like a floppy, but it had a disk in it. And then you insert the caddy inside the disk drive. We installed the system, but then realized we didn't have the disk for the software that my dad requ- uh, needed to finish the commercial he was working on to make money so we can have food on the table. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and calling the company that was... At, back then, we were in Abu Dhabi in the Emirates. And the company to inst- that installs that software was in Germany. Oh, good. A short shipping distance away. (laughs) A short shipping distance away. And we discovered then that they didn't have the software on disk. They didn't supply it on disk because that was a rental type thing because we only were supposed to use that software for that commercial and then the license would expire after a few months. and I mean, a year. And that was it. We couldn't use it anymore. So. I, re- I remember hearing about those, like that used to be a common software thing. Like they would give you a license and the license literally expired. And then like, there wouldn't be a way to buy another license or no. anything. Like yeah, it's just like exactly. you got yeah. it and you used it and that's it. It was the days like, before subscri- before they figured out that subscriptions was something that they actually wanted. They wanted you to actually have to go physically buy the thing because I mean, you can obviously most of that stuff you couldn't go download. You had to go to comp USA and buy the literal thing. <laughs> like it's, Exactly. And when we requested the software, they were like, it doesn't exist on disk. You have to ship the whole machine to us to install it for you. And the machine itself weighed like a ton. I I feel kind of like spoiled because like when I go to the store, like I, especially when I was younger, even then, like picking up software on disk or anything like that just wasn't like, it was definitely a thing, but it wasn't as popular. Like, cause most, I mean, most people would just download it from a web browser. You are so young. <laughs> you're, such, yeah. you're such a baby. <laughs> so young. <laughs> okay. So let me school. I envy you let young me man. School I you. envy you young man. So, so, so <laughs> we used to have this place called Comp USA and Circuit City was another one. And they would ha- they'd yep. have. Electronic Express. Yeah, they, they had uh, aisles and are. aisles of software that you could buy. Right. And the thing, the reason why I keep saying Comp USA is because they used to do this thing called mail in rebates. And you'd get an ad flyer in the mail or in the newspaper. Newspapers are these things made of paper that you get the news in. <laughs> Anyways, you get, get the flyer in the mail and they, you'd get a whole bunch of software that you could get for free, but you had to go buy it. And then you'd send in your re- a copy of your receipt and they'd send you back the money in, in the form of a check. So. At the time, you got to remember, I was early teenage years. We'd just gotten a computer. It was a Gateway computer. came in 19 boxes because Gateways had these stores. And it was like $4,000, right? Had first computer had win- Windows 98 on it. And we got obsessed with these mail-in rebate free software things because we'd always, especially, you know, I was still living at home and you know, my mom and dad and we're like, whatever, we're like, there's a computer and all this stuff, right? We'd, we didn't have the internet at the time, right? We didn't even, hadn't even bothered with a phone line to the computer. And the thing is, is that they always had the mail-in rebate things for like card making programs and like early day Photoshop stuff. So you could like make greeting cards and stuff like that. We, in my closet behind me, I swear to God, I have approximately ten thousand dollars worth of free software that I got from Comp USA with mail and rebates of card making software. There's a there's a copy of Dragon Naturally Speaking in there, which is just the fucking most hilarious thing in the world. I mean, because I mean, text re- speech recognition back then was not good. I mean, I mean, it's not it's not very good now, but it was way way worse then. But that thing was like four hundred dollars at the time because it came with a, a microphone and everything it was a really, absolutely because I, you know, I thought i was going to be the hot shit i was going to be able to do my high school homework just talking it into the machine i was never going to have to type a paper ever 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 again that dream did not happen because it was so bad i mean it was like literally i mean you you would say this thing and it would say it, it had words completely different and if you tried to do punctuation it 
type the punctuation out if it re recognized the word whatsoever. It was bad. So I have all this software that it bought on disc and stuff it's hilarious and, I, and despite the fact that i hate subscription service the today's way better so it's just yeah to finish to, sorry, to finish Steve. my thing is it was then that i discovered that this software that the operating system that was installed on there because it was it wasn't original it was custom completely custom because unix and linux you can custom it had a butterfs type backup thing where it, it 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 was called cached backup cached backup for whatever reason it was called cached it had the name cached in it we discovered that it had the whole software install uh, the the company that installed the software had an image like you know when uh, oh, if you remember norton ghost image back in the day so it was an image that from which the company had uh, it was behind a password we couldn't restore it because it was behind a password that the co only the company in germany had access to so instead of having a disk and whatever shipping the whole machine over to germany they ship a person a tech support agent from germany to abu dhabi <laughs> to do a couple just of keystrokes a password? It, yeah just for a password what the heck? <laughs> Why? So the, basically they had a recovery partition it, like some of the Dells do. Yeah. But they had, in order yeah. to get to it, they had to have a tech support guy come out. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. He came all the way from Germany. And my dad being smart as he is, he took advantage. He kept the guy over in Abu Dhabi for four months. <laughs> How is that even possible? <laughs> Start paying well, he money. paid for he paid for his stay. Oh, uh, he paid for like his you're stay. not leaving, buddy. <laughs> you're not leaving because he needed tutoring on how to use that software. <laughs> so the guy, being from the company who created the software, he was okay as long as you pay me, I'm good. <laughs> so we ended up having the, the we had we had, we kept the guy for four months, and then my dad. But you cannot imagine the type of scolding I got. Oh. Bell, <laughs> thanks, Steve. You're not. You're never using the computer again. Uh, Nate, thank you for the super. Yeah, I know. I wasn't allowed to touch a computer ever again. And when we got the Mac, the first thing I did was dismantled. Nate, thank you for the super chat. I will read it, but I'm doing this under protest. Just wanted to announce a nuggy a day keeps the bugs and Linux away. Nate, you're fired. Uh, <laughs> Josh, you got another but story. Long for us. story short. Long story short, the nightmare was that. I was sweating cold sweat every second of I was staring at that monitor with with an unbootable system. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh never mess with <laughs> with things you don't understand. Because I have done it on Arch and I messed Arch multiple times, but that's just for me and that no nightmare stories here. At least you don't but have to hire was... somebody to come restart the computer for you. <laughs> yeah, twenty four thousand dollar machine, you don't mess with that. All right. Especially if it's not yours. Josh. Spend eight hundred dollars okay. on someone coming out okay. to enter a password. <laughs> the the year was two thousand and fourteen. This is okay. not a this is not an Ubuntu story. I was in uh, high school. I like this. All yeah, right. yeah. So I was out of college by about two years at this point. I'm sitting here, and I'm and I'm working a con a contract position for like this small computer repair shop, and we got this contract to work at a bank and to uh, help them help them modernize their computers. Uh, all their computers were from the late '90s. And uh, they somehow managed to keep them running for like 12, 14 years at this point. So uh, we had to migrate all of their systems from uh, these old AT hard drives, of which none of these computers had any kind of a network connection to speak of that could actually interface with the modern system because they didn't use TCP IP. <laughs> so it was tasked to me being the Linux guy to figure out how to mount an AT hard drive, which, bear in mind, this this is the beginnings of me learning Linux, so I didn't even know how to index. I 
I didn't even know how to index hard disks on Linux yet because, you know, why would I have to? Because when I use Linux, I just threw Ubuntu on a computer and just said go. <laughs> so uh, it was my job to pull the data off this hard drive and put it onto my disk. So I Google, what's the best way to back up a disk on Linux? And I see this command called rsync. And I'm like, okay, so I pull up the rsync uh, man page. You know, I just run man rsync. And I'm sitting here reading through this and like, oh, that's a cool flag. That's a cool flag. That's a cool flag. And then I see a delete dash during flag, uh, which uh, is kind of it. And I see a comment on like, it wasn't Stack Exchange. I think it was an Ask Ubuntu thread where it's just like, if you run this command while you're doing a fresh rsync, it's going to, going to process a lot faster too. So I run the dash dash di uh, delete and I'm expecting bash completion to exist. But bash completion does not exist on Ubuntu 14.04. Not, not, not by default. So... I run rsync dash dash del, which that is an that is actually an alias for a uh, delete dash during, and what that's and what that does is during the course of a transfer, it's going to delete a uh, data off of the off of a disk as it transfers. And as I'm sitting here running this this task to uh you know clone the data off this drive. I'm actually not writing anything to my to my fancy new disk. And what I'm doing is I'm deleting customer data off of a customer's uh disk. <laughs> because I'm because I called rsync backwards because I'm used to using dd. <laughs> no. Yeah. Did, Brother. Did you get fired? Safe to say, after that day, I was no longer an employee with that with that contractor. So yes, I did get fired. <laughs> it, it happened <laughs> because because I I literally deleted about uh, three million dollars worth of records. <laughs> That's quite a reputation to put on the resume, man. <laughs> like I, I, I'm definitely not getting a a, a, re a reference from those guys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> funny enough. Funny enough, my manager is now the uh, network administrator for my ISP. So he kn he knows this story and we joke about it. <laughs> <laughs> just 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 the fact that Josh talks to the network manager at his ISP is the most Josh like sentence ever uttered. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> okay. So uh, my last one is so I have had many problems obviously over the years with audio. But I don't think that I've, I've ever had such problems as I had when, for whatever reason, for a period of, I don't know, two weeks, maybe two years ago or so, I could not get my microphone to function as only an input device. For whatever reason, and this was when, this was like the... This was just like right after distros decided to start shipping Pipewire as default. It wasn't, it's kind of like Wayland is now. It's not, wasn't really ready for the mainstream, especially for people who have like a, a, a audio interface and multiple, you know, inputs and outputs and stuff like that. It always was, it was, it was early days and it was things messing around. So, and, and th this was distro for whatever reason, it was at that point, in my Linux career, I was very much an Arch guy, right? I was using either Arco or regular vanilla Arch. And I didn't want to switch away from that because the AUR was the most best thing ever. I was never switching away from it. Oh my God, you got to use the AUR. If you don't use the AUR, what is wrong with you? Oh my God, I use Arch, by the way. That was me. So I was I was an Arch fanboy back in the day. Glad I grew out of that shit. Uh, but <laughs> enough, enough. that's the Arch, guys. Sorry to interrupt. I got to go check on a puppy. I'll be back here in a minute. All right, man. So... Well, this to go through it is for whatever reason, it was treating the microphone as both an input and an output. So whenever it collected sound, it was also playing through the speakers. So I could hear it, my own voice through the speakers, but it wasn't like it was playing through like 
you know, a video or through a, a relay or whatever. It was actually coming directly through the microphone. And y you know, like when you have a, a sound bar and a TV connected together, and sometimes you have the sound bar volume on and the TV volume on at the same time, there's that little bitty itsy delay. This was that only like times a million and it would not stop. So it was kind of like an echo chamber in here for like two weeks. And it wasn't, I, I refused to jump from Arch. So I went from Arco to Arch. I tried at the point I went to like Endeavor OS and Manjaro. They all had the same problem. I think it was like right when Arch decided that they were going to push Pipewire by default for the first time. And eventually I did decide I was going to screw this. Obviously there's something wrong when the, maybe, maybe it was a kernel problem. I still don't know what the problem was because eventually it just stopped when I went to a different disc. Like I think I went to, I don't even know at this point where I went somewhere non arch at the point. And it was just such a frustrating thing. And, and the thing is that the, at that point I was very, like, I'm very anti Wayland right now. At that point, I was anti-Wayland as well, but I was also anti-Pipewire, and that was my shining example of how Pipewire just wasn't ready, and it's never going to be ready, and it was stupid, and why can't we just use Pulse Audio? Because Pulse Audio works, yeah, it's old and crusty and unmaintainable, but, you know, it's good, and it works, and whatever. And it was just, it was a one of those things that happened to you like where it just kind of confirmed your beliefs. And I, I actually just had <laughs> just, just this whole Wayland thing has been going on the last couple of days with my computer. It's kind of confirmed my beliefs about Wayland not being ready. The same thing happened with that without volume th that with that pipe wire thing. It's just like obviously pipe wire is broken. It's never going to work, and I need just to go to find a distribution that is is going to run pipe wire for literal ever. And I actually I think I'm pretty sure I went to Debian because I was for sure Debian's not going to get pipe wire until 2040. It's going to be fine. Uh, obviously they they went to pipe wire much faster than that, but uh, yeah, so I had some issues with, with audio. I think that, I, I think if there's one horror story that kind of can permeate amongst everyone who's ever used Linux, it's almost certainly an audio story. Because every single one of us, I know for sure, and I'm pretty sure everyone in the chat has at least one story where audio, even, even if you don't do anything complicated with audio, like if you're just, you know, listening to speakers or whatever, you probably have some kind of story where, eh, why didn't this just work? And obviously... Audio now, like in the last five years, is is actually way better. Way better than it was 10 years ago. Way better than it was 20 years ago. Because Pulse Audio didn't exist. And you're like, ah, I'm going to use some ALSA. <laughs> Let's just do... You, you want to configure your stuff? Let's open up that configuration file, shall we? It's going to be awesome. Yeah. <laughs> especially especially when you when you don't understand anything you're looking at in uh, with Pipewire. Because with Pipewire... Everything is like module this, module that, module this, module that, and it 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 gets to a point where oh, it's so confusing. At, at least for me, so I just copied Tyler. That's why I decided to copy Tyler's config file for Pipewire to try it for echo cancellation. I was like, he he sure knows what he's doing. I will copy his uh, his config. Well, now I learned that the same config does not work on two sets of hardware the same i think no, that's my problem way. it's because my hardware is different i need to to figure out a more general way to well uh, i discovered one way is to use pack ctl so pack ctl turns on apparently echo cancellation better than the config file does i'll i'll, I'll be trying that all right let's go ahead and move on to the nuggies of the week this is our section where we select awesome tools and tips and and whatever that we have to share with you and because i've been forced against my will we call them nuggies of the week even though i will always protest this so tyler whatever it is you're eating man <laughs> what's your th what's your what's your nuggie of the week i'm eating freeze dried sour skittles just so we're clear and <clears throat> they're delicious. But my nuggy of the week is if you don't if you don't already know Nick, if you are going to check out Nick's OS, one thing that you should probably check out is Home Manager. That's it. Home Manager is a way of configuring your home directory the way same way you would configure Nick's OS. It's the best it's way to cool. it's an interesting 
Sorry. Yeah, I'm just saying it's the best way to ensure that nobody who uses other distros uses your dot files. Yes. Yes. Because, I mean, it will literally place files and do stuff like that and s- install and set up programs for a specific user's home directory. Very cool. But you definitely, definitely don't want to check it out if you're not going to check out NixOS at the same time. So if that doesn't interest you, then don't listen to me. Nick's West for the win. Are you gonna get stickers and become a fanboy? He's already a fanboy. He's probably yeah. he's probably got he's probably got a Fiverr contractor right now working on Nick's OS stickers All right. just for us. So let's let, let not you Tyler, but the rest of us. Let's figure out how long do we think Tyler stays on Nick's OS? One week, two weeks, at the most. Over over under One two weeks. One month. Overly ambitious. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Have Have you decided that? Have you decided on your New Year's pledge yet, Tyler? Mm-mm. Okay, okay, okay. Hmm. I'm going to say... I mean, say, it could be staying on NixOS. I'm going to say that NixOS will probably last, at most, three weeks. And the reason why you leave is because you can't get a game to work. It's usually the reason. <laughs> Nate's, Nate's in the chat right now thinking, man, how am I going to get those crunches out of the microphone? <laughs> <laughs> it's easy. Just mute it. <laughs> as long as as long as Audacity is working. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Hopefully, Audacity still hasn't crashed. All right, Steve, your nuggy of the week, please. My nuggy uh, of the week is OBS DroidCam plugin. The OBS DroidCam plugin. I for the longest time, ever since I started my channel, I've been using the OBS app with its own v4l2 loopback dash dc dash dkms package which didn't work very well it it worked whereas where it showed my camera in obs but i couldn't do anything like virtual cam i I used because i ship in my tool in my script i use uh, i ship obs as a flat pack the only right, the only correct way to ship OBS with all the Flatpak plugins. So all the plugins that are available on FlatHub that nobody can see unless you look for them in the terminal. But one of those plugins was DroidCam OB, uh, Droid Cam OBS camera. I'm like, I've been shipping this oh, this whole time. And I thought it was a way to connect to, to connect the app, the, uh, the DroidCam app, to OBS. I recently discovered that no, this app repla- uh, this plugin replaces the actual DroidCam app because this plugin allows you to use virtual camera, your phone as a camera in OBS, and then. At the same time, use the OBS virtual camera. I'm like, I've had this this whole time and I didn't know. And there's a separate, if you look on the Android or iOS store for uh, DroidCam, you would find two applications. One called DroidCam OBS and one called just simply DroidCam. The simply DroidCam is the wrong one to use. You have to use the DroidCam OBS because once you use that, you can use virtual cam without issue, which I'm using right now with you guys. And this whole time, I was using the wrong v- V4L2 loopback package if it weren't for Zany here to point that out. Because he was like, I don't know, man. It works. You need V4L2 loopback DKMS. I was like, but I have V4L2 loopback dash DC dash DKMS. I'm like, Okay, I need to look for that package he's telling me about. And I discovered that, yeah, there's two different packages. <laughs> so, yeah, just whatever you do, if you're going to use your, your, uh, your, your phone, iPhone or Android as a webcam, which I highly recommend because they're 10 times better than any webcam you can buy, with the exception uh, uh, of the $700 webcams, don't use the DroidCam app, the green one with the Droid in it. Don't use that. Use DroidCam OBS with the DroidCam OBS plugin, and you're good to go. Cool. All right, Josh, your thingy of the week. My thingy of the week is actually really cool. 
It's called uh, co- uh, COPPWR. I don't know what that stands for, but it is a t- it is a graphical tool for managing Pipewire directly. It sort of looks like a standard patch bay, and but it's not a patch bay. It's a diagnostic program. So Matt, I know that you're having some fun that you had some fun with, with Pipewire earlier. This tool probably could have actually helped you if you took the time to learn it because you know I'm still trying to learn it myself. But it it is a graphical tool designed for uh, that that will display that will display the that will communicate with the Pipewire sounds server itself, be able to show you the sample rates that's actively going, all the processes that are using Pipewire. How much work Pipewire is doing in the background, and it will show you where all the sound channels are connecting to, where they're going, their volume levels, and it, it's super in depth, and it's super cool. I I just don't know enough about it to be able to properly explain it. Sorry, <laughs> but it looks really cool. Uh, it's a lot like one of the, those old Jack utilities that would that would be able to like spin up and run the Jack server for you, and uh, be able to run. Like those really verbose ones, uh, not like Carla, but like the ones that pe- people were using before Carla. But uh, I've been, I've been uh, messing around with it here for probably the past couple days. Uh, j- you know, just looking, just uh, using it for like indexing, like my wire plumber configuration. To complement, to complement your tool, there's something called QPW Graph. Yeah, uh, this this can do everything uh, QPW Graph can do plus more. Okay, you can also save your profile and connect yeah. different outputs to different inputs. Yeah, you can. Everything? You can. You can not only save the patch bay layout, but you can save all the audio sample rates too that you would would adjust. Yeah, but can you connect an app, uh, 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 an uh, uh, audio from one app to another app as well? Yes, because since now sharing Windows on Wayland is possible. But if you want to share a video from a browser, for example, and get the audio from that browser to to Discord, I use QPW Graph usually to connect one uh, the uh, the audio from the browser to Discord, reroute it. Yeah, it it can it it can do that. And uh, on like beta versions of Pipewire, it can actually uh, take the video stream too and be able to pipe the video stream into a sound output. And only output just the sound from the video, and be able to output from that sound output to a video playback device, and you'll be able to get the video plus the sound. Uh, it'll it'll like do all, it can it can direct all that traffic and everything appropriately. All right, my thingy of the week, and I'm gonna go against the Foss ideals here, but I I've been playing Halo on the Steam Deck, and if you have I think it's like 40 bucks and you're like an old school Halo player from like the back in the day. The Halo Master Chief collection is on sale a lot actually. So you might might even be able to get it for less than 40 bucks. And it plays fantastically on the Steam Deck and on Linux, just regularly. So if you don't have the Steam Deck, you can just play it on your desktop. It is a obviously if you've played Halo before, you know what it is. It's 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 a very very good game. Uh, it did later in the series you know, kind of jumped the shark a little bit, and it found itself in another one. And then it jumped the shark again. It, it's been around for a long time, but the the early ones that the Master Chief Collection comes with are just spectacular, and they play so damn well on Linux, not on Wayland, but they they play. Uh, although it's weird, they play well on Steam Deck, which uses Wayland. So I don't understand what I'm doing wrong on my desktop. Uh, Game scope magic. Yeah, the, the, the Steam Valve's got something, some kind of wizardry going on there. But on the regular like Linux, as long as you use Xorg for me, it, it was working fantastically well. So, uh, add the add Master, excuse me, add the Master Chief Collection to your wish list on Steam. And like I said, it's on sale a lot, so you might be able to get like half price sometimes. Like I think even then, right now, right now it's forty dollars, which for the amount of game content that you're getting for that 40 bucks it has five yeah it has five halos as um i can't like it has odst and reach and three other ones i can't, I can't remember what they are but yeah you get five games and it, for 40 bucks is a good buy but i think i paid 29.99 for it uh like a couple weeks ago it's a really good deal and like i said if you like halo it, it, it it's definitely worth buying so anyway so that is it for the linux cast now 
by Josh. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know where I don't know where Josh went, but he, he managed to make it all the way to the end. <laughs> it definitely should have been on Gen two. Maybe that wouldn't happened. <laughs> Anyways, so that's the end of the Linux cast. Before we jump out of the show and say goodbye for the last time this year. We should jump into the contact information. You can get in contact with us uh, in many ways. The first way is to head on over to the website, thelinkscast.org. There you'll find previous episodes and blog posts. Also, you'll find a link to all of our stuff at thelinkscast.org slash contact. You can follow Steve. He's on uh, Mastodon. He's at falsedon.org slash zero link, zero with an X, not a Z. He's also coming back in 2024 with some YouTube content, so you can follow his YouTube channel. Link will be linuxcast.org slash contact. All that stuff is there. Tyler does make videos and stuff like that on YouTube as well. He's at youtube.com slash zanyog. Josh, who has disappeared from for some reason. I'm assuming his computer crashed or the power went out or pipe, oh, pipe wire. He texted me. Oh, he said he hit a kernel panic. Nice. <laughs> oh, well, for Debian being stable. <laughs> no. That's awesome. And anyways, you can you can find all of his stuff at tenleyj.com slash contact. Again, you can find all of this stuff at the linuxcast.org slash contact. All of the stuff is there, including links to the Discord server, my Discord server, Tyler's Discord server, Steve's Discord server, I think Josh's Discord server is linked there. You can... Uh, support me on Patreon at patreon.com slash LinuxCast. You can also head on over to the merch shop, which is shop.thelinuxcast.org. There you'll find t-shirts and mugs and hats and all sorts of stuff. Also, limited time I Hate Nuggies t-shirt, which is excellently designed if I do say so myself. All that stuff goes directly to help the channel, so I really do appreciate everyone who has gone over there and checked that out. Shop.thelinuxcast.org. I'm not quite as bad as Linus pimping the store, but I'm getting there. <laughs> I aspire to his greatness. Look, you're doing a good job. It's tasteful. Yeah, yeah. I don't. I don't. I just mention it once per episode, or twice, or maybe three times, maybe maybe five times. <laughs> every, every other breath. Shop.thelinuxcast.org. It's great. Anyways, thanks to everybody who does support me on Patreon and YouTube. You guys are all absolutely amazing. Without you, the channel would just not be anywhere near where it is right now. Um, and I'd be showing you the the end screen credits if I, you know wasn't on hyperland and my monitors weren't in the right order but anyways thanks for everybody who does support me on patreon youtube you guys are all absolutely amazing without you the channels would not be anywhere near where it is right now so thank you so very very much for your support i truly do appreciate it you guys are awesome and uh thank you for watching this was the last episode of the year we'll be, we'll be back in the first week of january we record this live every saturday but we won't be back until the first saturday of january i believe first or second set i think it's the first saturday of january it's like january 6th or something like that make sure you subscribe youtube.com slash linux cast we'll see you all then hope you have a happy wonderful holiday all that stuff and uh, we'll see you next time <laughs>